My name is Larry Novak, and today's seminar is the Practicing Engineer's Guide to Designing by Strut and Tie Modeling. Now, we're going to be talking quite a bit about strut and tie modeling. And the key here is to break through barriers. It's been in the code for some time, but there's a lot of confusion about its application, as well as how does one develop the model and things of that nature. So we're going to walk through the different process. Again, my name is Larry Novak. I'm a licensed structural engineer as well as a fellow of the American Concrete Institute, a fellow of the Structural Engineering Institute, a lead accredited professional, and I'm a full voting member on ACI 318 as well as ASC 7 for the building loads. And I've been instrumental in the development of the strut and tie modeling method in the ACI code. But I look at it from the point of view of a practicing engineer, as that's what I've historically done. So thinking from a practicing engineer's standpoint, I want to talk about the behavior of structures, then get into the specific code requirements and model development. And at the very end, that last segment she spoke about, we're going to walk through the actual design of a fairly complicated structure to show that it's not necessarily an easy process, but it's a very cookbook, if you don't mind me using that phrase, making it very easy to apply. And we're also going to talk about some of the pitfalls at the very end. So let, first we have to <clears throat> start with the very basics of shear stirrups and understanding this concept of strut and tie. Now what we have here on the screen is half a beam, so it's spanning from the left to the right symmetrically about the hook on the bottom. And what we've done is taken this beam and cut it along a, that black line, a full saw cut. And at the very top, we installed a little brass hinge that represents the compression zone. And normally, if I put a load on that silver piece, this would be a mechanism. But what keeps it together is drilled vertically through this beam, piece of wood, is a hole and through that hole we have strung that red bungee cord following that red dash line. So normally when we design a beam we design it by method of sections and that's what we always learn in school. You cut a section, you calculate the shear, you calculate the moment, you design for the moment, you design for the shear. So it's a very straightforward process but it's based on the idea of sections and that the moment and shear diagrams are very linear and can be easily calculated. Well, in this case, what happens in reality is this is not a mechanism because the stirrup lifts the load back up across that crack, which makes it very possible to support the load. So if you want to think of it as a truss where we have the load in tension going to the top of the beam, coming down in compression along this green line, in tension along the red line, and compression along the green line again, which makes for a stable structure and it's a truss. Even though it's a continuum medium, we are able to put a truss on it and this is literally how stirrups work. They assume a crack has already happened. Stirrups are not very useful if the crack has not already happened. So the key is we could do this by method of sections, but as you can see, we could also put a truss on it and literally calculate the forces. Now, a lot of times we apply this to deep beams, and there's a very good reason, because deep beams tend not to have linear um, shear and moment diagrams of the nature that we can easily calculate. We think we can calculate them, but they don't develop the way we do. I'll explain that in a few moments. And so by ACI 318.14, so this presentation is up to the latest code, we have a deep beam as defined when the clear span, the depth is less than 4H. So at that point, we have a deep beam. But you can use strut and tie modeling for anything, but for deep beams, it's really the only game in town. 
according to ACI 31814, deep beams shall be designed taking into account nonlinear distribution of longitudinal strain over the depth of the beam. What the heck does that even mean? Well, it certainly means I can't plug it into ADOS or plug it into ADAPT or plug it into S-Frame or any other computer program I want because typically those assume linear distribution of longitudinal strain over the depth. They don't get me a nonlinear solution. 